So, Susan, thank you for being here. Congratulations. Well, thank you for joining me. It, it is a pleasure. Um, so this book does many things, and it covers many subjects. But I think at its core, at least as I read it, it's a story of two remarkable men at pivotal points in their career and the career and story of African nationalism, who are Kwame Nkrumah and Patrice Lumumba. And I'm wondering if you could talk to us first about those two figures, about their relationship, and how it is that by studying them, you were able to open up this whole world of the CIA in Africa. Well, it's very nice for me that um, you have identified the relationship between Kwame Nkrumah and Patrice Lumumba as of key importance in this book. Because, in fact, the book started off um, with having nothing to do with the CIA. Mm. It was the um, intended to be a study of the relationship between these two remarkable men, the mm -hmm. first prime minister of Ghana and then president and the first prime minister of DR Congo. And I admire the leaders immensely. And I was also very... Over the years, I've become increasingly impressed and touched by the nature of their relationship. Um, they were truly remarkable men, and they both came from poor families, um, but managed to educate themselves to an astonishing degree. Um, Nkrumah managed to get himself to the US. Um, he studied at Lincoln, Pennsylvania, and, and Pennsylvania, and he was clearly brilliant. And um, he wanted to learn in order to bring freedom to Ghana, which was then the British-ruled Gold Coast. Lumumba also came from a very poor family. Um, and he wasn't able to go to university, but he was um, an autodidact. And he, he worked so hard to read and to think and to write. And both men took writing immensely seriously. And... There, after the time that they met, which I'll mention in a minute, um, they developed a kind of political um, alliance in which Nkrumah, um, who was in 1958, he was nearly um, 50, and Lumumba was about 35. So it was a kind of like uncle-nephew relationship and Lumumba felt so grateful that he had the opportunity to be guided by Nkrumah um, in his political education and in how to be a leader. Mm. And Lumumba um, and Nkrumah um, was very impressed by Lumumba's honesty, his sincerity, and his intelligence. But also, uh, Nkrumah identified the Congo as being of huge importance in terms of the future of Africa, especially since... Nkrumah's dream was to build the United States of Africa on the model of the United States of America. Mm. And so for, as far as he was concerned, it was so important that um, a man like Lumumba would um, lead a government in um, independent um, Congo and, and, and take the future of Africa forward, if you like. Um, and they met um, at a conference in Ghana in 1958, um, for the first time. And the conference was called Hands Off Africa. Africa must be free. And at that time, there were under 10 nations in Africa that were independent and free of European occupation and colonial rule. And people came from all over the continent in secret Freedom fighters, and when I say freedom fighters, I don't necessarily mean people with guns. I mean people who were writing and associating together and just trying to challenge the white supremacy that was, um, and colonial occupation that was devastating their lives. And they managed to get to um, Ghana for this Hands Off Africa conference. And as um, one person who went there said, um, Everybody was there, and um, all the, um, the, the famous Pan-African leaders that we know about, George Padmore, Frantz Fanon, everyone was there. And um, it was a very important conference. And if I can just um, take a moment to set globally the context in which 
it was so remarkable. In that same year, 1958, um, there was an expo um, exp exhibition mm. in Brussels, which was um, had um, nations, the richer nations across the world were represented, and the U.S. and the Soviet Union were almost next door. Which <laughs> Um, and um, the, it was seen as by the West mm. and um, the Soviet bloc as being sort of, this was the normal representation of the world. Mm. And the Belgian Congo, because Congo was colonized by Belgium at the time, um, sent... Um, a lot of information and representation. Um, so Belgium sent um, um, information about the Belgian Congo. But they also sent um, a number of Congolese people who they put in a very large space of, 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 of land. And they were expected to do um, what they called native work and live in huts and so on. And this was really a human zoo. It was nothing else. And this was in 1958, the same year as the Hands Off Africa Conference. And it was really, really dreadful. I mean, people would go past and throw in bananas. I'm not joking. This, this happened. And um, in fact, the um, Congolese people who were sent finally gave up. So they said, they can't do it anymore. We're going home. So they did. Meanwhile, in 1958, again, as I say, the Hands Off Africa conference was taking place in Accra when it just seemed people felt euphoric by the end. You know, Africa will be free in our lifetimes it's very, very soon. It really seemed possible. It was also a very important conference because um, it started off with a consensus that nonviolence, Gandhian nonviolence, was the way forward. But then Frantz Fanon um, spoke in a um, very passionate speech. Fanon, who was very much the intellectual, you know, um, very, very serious, but he became passionate and he was leaning forward into the lectern and saying, we can't have nonviolence. Look what's happening in Algeria. Mm. Look what's being done to people in Algeria. You can't just let that happen. We have to, we, we have to um, abandon this commitment to nonviolence. Anyway, that shook the conference up and especially um, all the reporters from various parts of the world that were there. So, um, and just to make the point that um, in this respect, that Lumumba remained committed to nonviolence until the end of his life. I mean, one thinks about his savage murder, um, assassination, this man who's so peaceful, so trusting, um, and committed to nonviolence. But Nkrumah changed his mind. Mm -hmm. He said, this is hopeless. Mm -hmm. so, so Nkrumah and Lumumba met. They gelled. They just made sense. Lumumba um, was brought up to the top table, if you like, with Nkrumah. And um, it was absolutely extraordinary. And I got very involved in doing research on the Hands Off Africa conference. And then I suddenly thought, hmm, this is odd. And so. The organizers of the conference were regretful that there, there was initially there was no um, official representation of congratulations mm -hmm. from the USA because many people um, who were fighting for freedom mm -hmm. in the continent of Africa saw the USA as, as such an inspiration because mm -hmm. it had thrown off British colonial rule. And um, they were distressed that there was no official um, representation mm -hmm. from the US government. Mm -hmm. However, there were many numbers of uh, f representations of the state of the US mm -hmm. at the conference in the form of the CIA mm -hmm. in so many ways, including the interpreter of Lumumba, in terms of representatives of CIA fronts, like the American Society of African Culture, the African American Institute, um, and in terms of the African American Institute, the AAI, in fact, the Ghanaian police found the editor of the AAI journal under the stage with recording equipment, and he wasn't allowed to be there. Mm. <laughs> so a lot of these things were um, mm. happening, and the more I found, the more I found, which was 
disturbing. It was sort of getting in the way of the story. Mm. It was getting in the way of the relationship between Nkrumah and Lumumba. And um, I had a very important conversation with my editor yeah. um, in, in New York about this of public affairs. And I said, um, you know, this is getting very difficult because I'm trying just to concentrate on Nkrumah and Lumumba. But the CIA kept, keeps getting in the way. It's sort of taking over. It's crawling over the story. I don't know what to do. And, um, and this is so, so nice that you picked on that relationship as being, at, as being important and at the core of the book. And so he said, um, OK, Susan, well, you can carry on trying to do that, or you could change the way you're writing the book. And you could allow the CIA, which is making itself known almost <laughs> through all your archival and other research, and bring that in to the story. And I thought, hmm, yes. Mm. And, um, and then we um, exchanged some credit. It was a very exciting moment, mm. emails, phone calls, and so on, about what I was going to do. Mm. And we made that change. And so it became this book. So that's how mm. I then um, started writing about um, the CIA in Africa at that time. And, and just to say that, you know, as I to repeat what I said, the more I found, the more I found. It's like, I pick up a rock and I find more CIA. Mm -hmm. They're just doing everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I think that, what, that when I mentioned earlier some of the things that struck me from my own studies and that you have moments in here where the CIA appears in very unexpected places and that some of those will perhaps will come to. Um, but I want to kind of move systematically into this and I think it's worth emphasizing another point with Lumumba and Nkrumah is that part of what made them so such powerful advocates for the nation was that they're both coming from places of incredible diversity and they don't come from traditional power elites. They are not yeah. of the major ethnic <laughs> groups that have dominated these polities under colonial rule. Yeah. And so nationalism to them becomes a vehicle for creating something new. And I think the point you make about the United States is really important. And you talk in the book about the importance of, say for example, JFK's speech to the Senate in 1957, yeah. in which he castigates American support for the French in Algeria, saying that the United States needs to be in support of decolonization. Now, it's interesting here because the book's subtitle suggests that, in fact, the United States becomes involved in recolonization, not decolonization. And I know from talking to you that your preferred term was also Nkrumah's, which is neocolonialism, a term that is, is given to one of Nkrumah's best known books. I'm wondering if you could kind of show us a little bit of the fields of play from the perspective of the CIA. What was the CIA and by, through the CIA, the American government's interest in countries like Ghana and especially in Congo? And how does that help to shape their approach to these two nationalist figures? Well, I think um, <clears throat> it's an, another, um, when I, started the work on this book, as well as the relationship between Nkrumah and Lumumba, I also saw at the center of that concerns relating to um, superpower interest in atomic issues. Mm -hmm. And um, many of you will know that there's a mine in the province of Katanga mm -hmm. in DR Congo, <coughs> the southernmost province um, a mine called Shinkalobwe, which produces uranium that is incredibly rich. I mean, just astonishingly, uniquely rich. And um, Albert Einstein had, and certainly if you've seen the film Oppenheimer, which we could perhaps look at just a little bit, Albert Einstein wrote to Roosevelt and said, no, you're going to have to do something about making sure that um, you can develop um, atomic weapons in this context. And he referred specifically to Belgian Congo uranium, which is not mentioned in the film, by the way. There's no reference to um, Congolese uranium at all, which has been very upsetting and disappointing mm -hmm. to Congolese and friends of mine and other fr friends of mine in other African countries because they feel that that's just been wiped out. And just to say that in that um, connection, uh, I don't know what your thought about the film was, but, and I think it's a great biopic, but in terms of that, it is entirely consistent with what happened in 1945 after the dropping of the atomic bombs on Japan, because Churchill, Churchill wrote a speech um, 
which referred to the fact that Canada had provided the US mm -hmm. with remarkable uranium, that it had been explicitly said this, which was such a lie, um, which was used to build the atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan. And he was triumphant about it, which is, in any case, not very nice, but um, that's an understatement. And um, um, Roosevelt um, didn't refer to uranium at all. Um, but there were other um, senior American officials who did refer to uranium, but they didn't refer necessarily to um, Canada. But there was a deliberate effort to um, conceal the fact that this extraordinary um, uranium, which was essential for the Manhattan Project and building these atomic bombs dropped on Japan, for um, to have access to that uranium. And at the end of the war, to ensure that the Soviet Union did not mm. get hold of the um, um, uranium um, that was derived from this particular mine. So this concern about the uranium mine and other minerals, strategic minerals of all kinds, um, made the Congo very important mm. to the US. And they were explicit about it. Mm -hmm we need to have control and maintain control over these, over these minerals. And of course, mm -hmm. geographically, um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is sort of at the center mm -hmm. of Africa. And um, so it seemed um, very um, crucial for Americans to um, the US state to maintain control of this uranium. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I won't share my full review of Oppenheimer. Although, yeah. I, and as I watched the movie, I had, I think, the most insightful thought that ever occurred to me, which was that it was a great illustration of quantum theory and the idea that things can be two things at once, in that the movie was both bad and good. Yeah. So that, I was very proud of myself at that moment, and then stopped paying attention for the rest of the three hours. Um, yeah, but just to say, I mean, those, those marbles or balls yeah. that are put in this, this um, yeah. I mean, I think, oh, there's some... All of those were Congolese lives. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. but, um, well, let's kind of get into the history of Congo because I think there's two things. Um, and I would love to hear you th talk about, and at some point, about the CIA's approach to African nationalism in general and to Kwame Nkrumah in particular. But the main focus of the book and the crux of it is Congo and how the CIA becomes to be, begins to be involved in Congo and how the CIA ends up pursuing a particular set of goals to keep that uranium safely under the control, not of a colony, but of a friendly government, as opposed to where it thinks Lumumba might lead the Congo. Um, can you walk us through that a little bit? How does the CIA think about Lumumba? How does the CIA come to view the political situation in Congo? And can you talk a little bit about the steps to which the CIA goes to ensure the outcome that they see as in okay. American national interest. Okay, I wonder if, if you uh, wouldn't mind if I read just a short passage, of course, which I think um, will to some degree answer your question and also help put some flesh on the title. Please. Okay. I'll just find it. This is um, a discussion of a um, meeting on the 14th of January, 1960 of the National Security Council when President Eisenhower is reviewing the matter of US policy toward Africa. And he said, there was a perceived need, he observed, for access to such military rights and facilities and strategic resources as may be required in our national security interests. And Alan Dulles, the director of the CIA, explained to the council the position of the CIA. The chances, he said, in Africa of orderly economic development and political progress towards self-determination were just about nil. And the president agreed. So did Vice President Nixon. And he reported that Ghana, according to the British, had only a 50% chance for an orderly development. Nixon then offered his personal opinion of people living on the African continent. Some of the peoples of Africa, he maintained, have been out of the trees for only about 50 years. Later in the meeting, Maurice Stans, a senior member of the Eisenhower administration who had recently visited the Belgian Congo, suggested that Nixon was being too generous in his opinion of Africans. He himself, he said, had formed the impression that many Africans still belonged in the trees. 
No one at the meeting, including Eisenhower and Dulles, challenged these deeply offensive characterizations by Nixon and Stans. Nixon shared his conviction that America should associate with what he called the strong men in Africa. We must recognize, he said, although we cannot say it publicly, that we need the strong men of Africa on our side. And Nixon pushed his argument further. He believed that it would be impossible to stop the process of independence in Africa. It was therefore necessary, he said, not simply to support strong men, but actively, in some cases, to develop, and I quote, military strong men as an offset to communist development of the labor unions. Such a policy ran counter to America's public stated commitment to democracy for all nations, but Eisenhower agreed. I think that's a fairly eloquent expression of American position, and it raises um, two points that I, I would like us to pursue. One is this idea and this, this tension that you see the intelligence industry within the United States and the president in this case, and this is surely something that a, a sentiment perhaps less crudely expressed but shared by the successor to the Eisenhower and Nixon administration. Um, this tension between the idea of the military strongman and the threat of communist rule. And then the second and underlined and kind of underpinning and structuring that discourse is of course, as you have, is the question of race, which comes very explicitly in the title of the book. So I'm wondering if first, before we get into the question of race, which I think could take us in a number of directions, if you could talk a little bit about how the CIA understood the influence of communists in Africa, and also, and this is a little bit beside the direct focus of the book itself, but what was actually happening in terms of communist play, as it were, within Africa? What influence did communists have? Because the Soviet Union, of course, was also engaged in intelligence exercises in the continent. How, in your research, did you assess what kind of competition was going on? Mm. Well. As you say, the Soviet Union, the Soviet bloc was indeed involved in territory, um, nations in Africa and the territories becoming independent in Africa and who, which had become independent. And I think it was a very complicated picture because what we don't see is, or at least I haven't seen, is any documentary or other evidence of Soviet attempts to um, overthrow mm -hmm. leaders, to assassinate leaders, and so on. We see, it seems to me, more of um, Andre Bluang, for example, who um, um, is working with Lumumba, um, describes going to a Soviet clinic and being very impressed because they're speaking Lingala there. So very much a lot of soft power. Mm -hmm. and, um, but then I suppose also just moving in to um, take um, um, to take credit, if you like, for representing a certain kind of freedom, mm. and in some ways um, that also served the U.S. well because I can recall that when Lumumba planned, he asked the U.S. to help get rid of the Belgians when they, after independence, they came straight back in mm -hmm. um, for so they had they um, established some justifications for needing to come in to protect Belgian people, and um, which were entirely um, spurious. And then um, Lumumba asked the US, please will you help me get rid of them? Because Lumumba, as I've said, mm -hmm. had such hope for um, the model of America, the United States of America, and just Americanism. And, um, but the US said no, turned to the UN. So, Lumumba turned to the UN and he arranged to go to the UN in New York and to speak to um, Secretary General Hammarskjöld. And um, he asked, in order to do that, um, this was at the end of July 1960, he um, asked the US to provide a plane. Mm -hmm. The US said no. And um, I have seen some discussions, um, documentary discussions, in official discussions in which it said, this is quite good because it means he'll have to turn to the Soviets because he'll need a plane, and that will serve us well. It was a way of an opportunity for smearing him. And, um, and indeed, the Soviets did jump in and say, here's, here's a plane for you. So he took the plane. And then um, when the number arrived, he discovered that there was a lot of press coverage 
um, identifying Lumumba as pro-Soviet, he'd come on a Soviet plane, and so on. And that um, that's, seems to me sort of very, um, well, disingenuous isn't quite the right word, but one man thinks that, for example, in the context of the difficulties of traveling around um, the Congo, planes were shared, and in fact, even the British um, army, or well, seconded from the British army, this dreadful villain who we were <laughs> discussing earlier, Major General Henry Templar um, Alexander, he, he took a Soviet plane mm -hmm. from Accra to Congo, and he actually wrote about it in his memoir and said, it was wonderful. When we crossed the equator, we had vodka and <laughs> we had caviar, and when I arrived, I was in such a good mood. But that was all right. So, um, so I think that sort of relationship between um, what's perceived in terms of what is Soviet, what is non-Soviet, gets incredibly messy and is exploited. So, um, um, obviously, at the Hands Off Africa conference, there were Soviet representatives as well. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, it's, it's a complicated picture. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, one of the important themes, well, themes isn't quite the right word, but understandings that emerged for me from my work for this book is that the, dis the description of the last century, the 20th century, mm -hmm. as being all about the Cold War is very limited. Of course, it was so dominated by the Cold War mm -hmm. and you know, the, the threat of who was going to blow up the world with atomic weapons. And I mean, this was real. This was huge. Mm -hmm. So that was of huge importance. And, and in a sense, what was going on in Congo and Ghana and, mm -hmm. of course, Angola later on were proxy wars, in a sense, arguably. But from the point of view of the Pan-Africanist leaders like Nkrumah, Lumumba, Kaunda, the, the evil was not the Soviet Union. The evil was white supremacy, racism, the apartheid that was developing profoundly and deeply, um, which you've written about, so the resistance to it so powerfully. Um, that was the, um, the, um, the big evil that, and was devastating their lives mm -hmm. and their families' lives and their future. Mm -hmm. That was the big evil to fight against. And Nkrumah actually said uh, in 1960, at all costs, we need to make sure we do not participate mm -hmm. the Cold War. But what he didn't understand then, but he did later, was that from the point of view of the US government, you're either with us mm -hmm. or you're against us. And when the US decided Nkrumah was against us, mm -hmm. then that was it for Nkrumah, really. And, um, and also with, with Lumumba. Mm -hmm. And um, so, um, but I can see, you know, certainly um, um, in, in different ways, in different styles, the US and Soviets did, did some similar things. And um, Wale Sienka, who, um, was enormously um, sponsored by the CIA. And um, when he found out in the mid-1960s that so much of the conferences he'd attended to, the publishers who'd published him, just, it's very extensive, had been the CIA, he was incredibly upset. Mm. And um, he referred to the CIA as the devil incarnate. Mm. He referred to the reptilian coils of the CIA mm. identifying the the spider's web of CIA influence, if you like, so soft power, assassinations. Um, and the Soviets were also um, um, printing material, um, distributing. In fact, Wally Sienka complains that you never really got, with the CIA, you got paid so well. Um, you know, money ran the game. Um, AMSAC was called mm -hmm. Uncle Moneybags, whereas the Soviets, they didn't really get the money, and you had, to, <laughs> you had to try and get some royalties, but you could only spend them, the royalties, in that, the particular country which, mm -hmm. where that story that they'd written had been printed. So it was very complicated. I think, I mean, such an interesting answer, and also one that really helps us, at, for me, as a historian of the 20th century, and think about the ways in which we understand the complexity of this period. And I think that you're right, that the tendency is to to focus on the Cold War, and we've, we've kind of, the scholarship and our understanding of the Cold War has matured, 
And so we no longer just focus on the Americans and the Soviets. We understand the ramifications of the Cold War as widely dispersed and quite not cold, quite hot in places like yeah. Angola, Congo, and elsewhere. Um, and I think that, you, but what you do is you bring us even closer to the perspective of those people caught up in that. And from them, and I, and I appreciate your understanding of this, that they're dealing with imperialism as a manifestation of white supremacy and racism, not the Cold War as the CIA has insisted on seeing things. One of the things I think is so valuable about this book is that focus on race. And one of the illustrations you have, it comes quite subtly, is in talking about the American policy about towards African countries having atomic reactors. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what your research uncovered about how American racial thinking influenced our policy regarding atomic energy. Oh, yeah, that's a really um, um, important question. Um, <clears throat> so Eisenhower delivered a speech in 1953 called Atoms for Peace. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that in this modern world, modern technology, atomic reactors could be used globally so this, to maximize the potential of atomic energy um, of, of all kinds. And this inspired um, many people across the globe, including Nkrumah. Mm -hmm. And um, Nkrumah decided that um, Ghana must have an atomic reactor. And, um, and he set up a, um, um, he, he created a, the, uh, the infrastructure for a, an atomic reactor in a place called Kwabenya, just on the outskirts of Accra, which then became known as Atomic Junction. Mm -hmm. And he was very excited about it. And he said at the time, um, I know that some people will think this is a step towards building atomic weapons. He said, I am completely opposed to atomic weapons. Mm -hmm. I, I'm completely opposed to French atomic testing. Mm -hmm on our territory, which we're monitoring, and we resent, because nobody's asked us, nobody's asked anyone in the Congo um, or in any of the regions, and we resent it, and it's got to stop. But what we do want, we, we need energy, and this is a way of getting it. And um, he asked Canada for a, a reactor, help with the reactor. Canada was influenced by the US to say no. So then, of course, Nkrumah turned to the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union said, yes, by all means, and we'll send you all kinds of professionals that you'll need to help with it, which um, got un underway. And um, the story of the Ghanaian um, atomic reactor becomes more complicated because Nkrumah then in later invited um, a, um, a, a British um, physicist who had been working on the Manhattan Project and uh, was a Russian spy. <laughs> and he had... Um, on the day that the, drum, the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, he um, gave some secrets and some uranium even to his Soviet handler. Anyway, he was found out and put in prison, I think, for five years. And then he was invited by Nkrumah to come and participate in the, um, uh, the teaching of the next generation at the university. And, and he went, and the US was really upset about this, and the UK wasn't happy either, but was unable to stop it. When um, Ghana was, um, when Nkrumah was overthrown in a um, coup that was um, heavily backed by the CIA in 1966, a coup that was called Operation Cold Chop, yeah. um, the British sent after that, and then Nkrumah went into exile, um, the British sent over a, um, a, a very well-known physicist, atomic physicist, um, who did a study of what should happen. And surprisingly, he decided it had to be closed down, mm -hmm. which really upset the Ghanaian um, physicists who were so much hoping it would continue. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened in Ghana. Um, meanwhile, in what was the Belgian Congo, um, there was an atomic reactor that had been sent by... Um, the US government, the US government, to say thank you to Belgium for Belgian ore, which of course came from the Congo, mm -hmm. um, sent, uh, enabled um, a reactor in Belgium, and also sent one to the Belgian Congo. Mm -hmm. And um, that was in 1958, and the Trico. 
and it was made critical in 1959. And because at that point, still nobody realized that, or guessed, that the Congo would be independent the following year. Mm -hmm. They just weren't prepared for that at all. So, um, that, so this um, reactor went critical. And um, just, just after independence, Larry Devlin, the CIA chief of station, was instructed from the US to go and um, take off the rods. And he said, you must be joking. Mm -hmm. And um, spoke to someone <laughs> who was in the know and said, you must be joking. So he didn't do that, and it just got left. Mm -hmm. But um, so um, there was a concern by the US that there was this reactor in Leopoldville, now Kinshasa. And the US um, helped to get rid of, and the Western powers helped to get rid of the building of the atomic reactor in Ghana. Meanwhile, the, um, the US was assisting apartheid South Africa with the building of an atomic reactor. I think it's the Safari, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, was doing all it could to assist that. And there does seem to be, um, well, there is, <laughs> and this is reflected in the language that's used in the documentation that it was considered dangerous mm -hmm. for anything atomic to be in the hands of people with a black skin. Mm -hmm. It was as simple as that. Mm 